Well, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out in this light rain. Still nicer here than in D.C., I'll just make that point. I'm Jennifer Steinhauer. I'm director of the speaker series here at the Institute of Politics, and we're pleased to welcome you to tonight's conversation about the upcoming 2022 midterm elections moderated by CBS News chief political analyst John Dickerson. Before one of our students formally announces our guests, I want to just mention a couple upcoming events we have at IOP and go over a couple of housekeeping notes. On October 10th, IOP Director David Axelrod will interview Cody Keenan, who served as President Obama's speechwriter for a live taping of the Axe Files. That will be at the Rubenstein Forum in University Room B, beginning at 530. On October 11th, David will also launch a multi-part series um, also focused on the upcoming mi midterms. The first event will feature pollsters Tony Fabrizio and John Anzalone, along with Republican strategist and former IOP Pritzker fellow Sarah Longwell. The event, known as Hacks and Acts, will take place in the IOP living room at 3.30. And on October 12th, journalist Essie Cup will convene a diverse group of experts to unspool the history of gun use in the United States. This event featuring author Ryan Busey, Midwest Regional Director of the National African American Gun Association, Chad King, and University of Chicago Law School Professor Allison LaCroix. And that will be in the Rubenstein Forum, University Room B, beginning at 5.30. Um, after today's moderated discussion, we'll open the floor to take questions from you in the audience. Please line up and ask your questions, which end in a question mark at the microphone. And as usual, we will give priority to the first questions um, to our students. For now, please make sure your phones are on silent, and we will hear our formal introduction of our speaker, speakers and moderator from Annalise Escher, a Wisconsin native and an MPP and MBA second year student. Please join me in welcoming Annalise. Thank you. Um, hello and welcome to Looking Toward the Midterms, a panel discussion and real-time analysis of where the upcoming 2022 midterms are headed. As Jennifer mentioned, my name is Annalise Escher. I'm a current second-year student in the Joint Masters of Public Policy and MBA program here at the University of Chicago. I'm focusing on finance and economic policy. I'm originally from La Crosse, Wisconsin, located in Wisconsin's 3rd Congressional District, which is a pretty contentious swing district this year, so I'm very interested to hear today's conversation. We have three excellent voices on uh, this afternoon's panel. First is Jasmine Uyoa, who is a national po politics reporter for the New York Times, where she covers congressional races and American politics. She's previously covered state and national elections at outlets including the Boston Globe, Los Angeles Times, and she's a recipient of the 2020 Robin Bentoner Prize for Excellence in Political Reporting. Nathan Gonzalez is editor and publisher of Inside Elections, a nonpartisan source of analysis on House, Senate, gubernatorial, and presidential elections. And he's also an elections analyst for CQ Roll Call. Liz Smith is a political strategist who served on Pete Buttigieg's 2020 presidential campaign and Barack Obama's 2012 re-election campaign. She's the author of New York Times bestseller, Any Given Tuesday, a behind-the-scenes look into American politics. And finally, today's conversation will be moderated by CBS News Chief Political Analyst and New York Times bestselling author John Dickerson. Please give me, join me in giving a warm, warm welcome to our panel. Thank you, Annalise. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad all of you are here. We can't really see you, um, so we're just going to assume you're smiling and uh, listening to us with rapt attention. I'm very glad to be here with all of you. Um, so it, just a little roadmap. We're going to talk for about 35 minutes. Um, I'm going to try and start us out really wide, wide lens, and then we can get uh, narrow. If you want to get narrow, narrow right away, and you, you can ignore me, and that's fine. Um, so just I'll start with a little table setting on the, on the um, so this election is simple in, on the one hand. It's the House and Senate are up for grabs. Will Republicans or Democrats control it? That's it. That's an easy, simple question. The thing is, it happens in the most confusing and muddy time in American history and maybe even the history of um, mankind, not to set the stakes too high. We have an economy that is in turmoil and our ability to measure the economy is confusing policymakers and voters in the country. The workplace is changing more than it probably ever has since people left the countryside to come into the city. The American dream, which used to be based on the idea of a pluralistic society where admittance was based on an idea and not whether you, where you were born, is under threat. There are, uh, in part because of the demographics that are changing in America, which is to some the promise of the country, to others is a threat to its existence. In the world, the idea that countries connected by economies would be more peaceful is crumbling. 
Power uh, through military might as an organizing principle is returning. Autocrats have their own club now. Democracies are on the wane. These are all the challenges that we're going to talk about that the lawmakers that are going to get elected in this election are going to, to face. But the question is whether our ability to face big challenges through the democratic process works anymore and whether people are going to resort to violence when they don't get the outcome they want in an election. And that is further uh, exacerbated by the fact that the very nature of truth is under assault by one of America's two political parties. So now that I've brought in all those dark clouds, um, I want to ask you all three the same kind of question. You know the, you know the parable, Liz, of the, of the blind men and the elephant. The blind men touch the elephant. Each one is touching a different part. They each give a different description of the elephant. So let's assume the election is the elephant. Okay. Each of you give me your view from whatever vantage point you want. What is, what's happening in this election right now? Well, you know, I think every time, every time I do this, every two, four years I'm asked about this, I always say, well, this is the most important or the most turbulent election of my lifetime. And this time I really, really mean it, though. <laughs> um, and there have been so, it, this has been a, such a roller coaster of an election that has been defined by these massive events that have led to massive swings um, in public opinion. And the first one that I would pinpoint was um, the Afghanistan withdrawal um, and the sort of chaos that surrounded that. Um, and generally you would think, okay, Afghanistan withdrawal, that's going to affect federal races, it's going to affect you know, U.S. Senate, Congress uh, candidates. But I heard, I talked to a campaign manager for a county executive running in Long Island in 2020-21, and they said that they could pinpoint when exactly their numbers started to tank. And it was right in the middle of that withdrawal, because that's where you just saw Biden's numbers start to collapse. So you had that, and then that sort of set us on a trajectory where it looked like Democrats were going to get absolutely hosed in the midterms. And, but then you have this like traumatic thing, this, this sort of divine intervention, or I, you know, I'm pro-choice, so I, whatever the opposite of divine is, um, with the Dobbs decision, which is as big as a, a game changer as you can get, really, in an election, you know, not quite on the level of like a 9-11, but it really did shift the terrain. Um, and it felt like, wow, with Kansas, with New York 19, that Democrats were really on the upswing. But now there are just the smaller things, but where I feel like the, the election atmosphere is shifting. And I talked to a friend on a battleground house race the other day, and he said, we will win, but there are two things that keep me up at night gas prices and COVID. And the problem with that is this. There's an OPEC um, announcement yesterday, which is that they're going to, what was it, cut back on you know, the oil that they're releasing. So that would mm -hmm. naturally potentially lead to a rise in gas prices. And it looks like that we are in store for another COVID surge. And so those are two things that are completely out of our control. And that could really um, help this election swing back and revert to what you traditionally think of as a midterm election where the party in power um, gets uh, destroyed. Trounced, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have many things, issues in there, gas prices and, and COVID, also the issue of nationalized elections. So you've raised a lot of things we're gonna to touch on later. Your turn with the elephant. Yeah, <laughs> Your so turn I, with the my, elephant. my perspective is as a political handicapper analyst trying to figure out what's going on, which is a very easy thing to do. Um, and I thought for a year and a half of this cycle, we were going to finally have a fairly typical election. Right. Elect midterm elections or a referendum on the president. For the president after Afghanistan has uh, had terrible to mediocre job rating. President's party is going to get thumped. Let's go through with it live to the next election. And then Dobbs and some of the things that Liz talked about created an uncertainty. It's not as much just a referendum election. Now it's a little bit more of a choice. And that muddies the waters. And, and so I'm looking at it from a perspective, not just trying to figure out what's going on, but what's the reliability of polling. Uh, we could probably have a three hour session on that on its own, but that and is- boy, wouldn't that be exciting. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get the YouTube viewers up on that. Um, but it is, uh, you know, I'm still a believer in quantitative data, even if polling is an imperfect or imprecise measure, it's still, I'd rather have quantitative data than just relying on retweets and anecdotes. Uh, but it's, it is, uh, it keeps me up at night, more than just my 
four kids uh, trying to figure out what's going on because we're in this holding pattern where there are pieces of evidence where Democrats have been doing better over the last couple of months. Biden's job rating has been a couple of points better, generic ballots better, five special elections where Democrats have overperformed Nebraska, Minnesota, two in New York and Alaska. You start to think maybe this is going to be an atypical midterm, but when we look at the House battlefield, the 75 races that we're focused on, we haven't seen a dramatic shift toward Democrats uh, that we sort of, you, you start to put together that picture on a national level. We haven't seen it at the individual district level, and that's really what matters. The national generic ballot doesn't matter as much as what's happening in these individual races. So, um, Jasmine, you've been on the ground in these states that we're all going to be obsessed with. Um, what does the election look like from your vantage point? Yeah, I was, I was going to just actually start with that. I've been kind of crisscrossing the country, Alaska, Michigan, Arizona, watching these events unfold on real time and trying to take the temperature of, of voters on the ground as, as, as they're happening. But um, I've been really fascinated and, and most interested in looking at the use of the border as a, a political tool, which is really a staple of American politics, right? The arguments in favor or against immigration haven't really changed in, in the last um, few decades. And some of them even go back further to the 1910s and the 1920s when Mexican blue collar workers were crossing over to um, work in the fields and lay, lay uh, railroad tracks. Um, we were hearing the same kind of, of, of rhetoric, and so it's, it's waned, and, and then it comes roaring back through, through time, and we're in one of those moments where it's just really hitting a, a, a fever pitch. And that's, that, that's been something that's really interesting to watch, is the, it, what's, what's different now is the volume, the intensity, uh, the reach of, of candidates who are um, talking about the border, talking about anti, you know, echoing this anti-immigrant sentiment in states really far from the border. Uh, senators like uh, Marsha Blackburn in ten Tennessee saying every state is a border state. So looking at the space that that occupies in Americans um, has been important to me and it's been important because it, it hits to me, um, it kind of goes to the root of, of, of why our democracy is so fragile, which is what you kind of mentioned at the beginning, is, is that fear of the demographic change, fear of the of a changing nation, and, and I hear it from voters. I hear this, this sentiment from voters across all these trends that we're talking about. <laughs> and you're, you're probably hearing about it in Michigan as well as Arizona, right? And Arizona? Ohio, yes, right. and now, Alaska. <laughs> so let me stay with you for a second, Jasmine. So um, d d uh, talk a little bit more about the immigration issue, both as it's used as a political weapon, but then also as it relates to, because I know you've done a lot of work with looking at the Latino vote, there's so much sloppy, blunt analysis about the Latino vote on this issue and then just more broadly. But um, talk about how the issue is used by Republicans mostly and then also how it intersects with the Latino vote in different places. Yes, so the, the issue, how, how it's being used by Republicans in this moment is to say our borders are unchecked. Uh, and, and all the American, the, the ills in American cities are stemming from the border, the fentanyl, the immigrant, you know, immigrants uh, that are going to take your jobs and not only your jobs, but your, are, and this is a lie, vote Democrat, right? So that, that's been a, a common conspiracy theory that's, that's been spreading. Um, and then what was the second part of that question? Oh, Latino voters. Yeah. So what's been interesting about Latino voters is that for the longest time Republicans thought that in their outreach to Latino voters this type of rhetoric wouldn't resonate um, and what is happening now is that it not it not only is it um, it, it, it is not only is it not not resonating in, in many cases it is is becoming a motivating factor so it's it's drawing people drawing Latinos in who, who share that anti-immigrant sentiment and so I think that that has com confused and shattered a lot of misconceptions about, about Latino voters. Yeah. And we can talk about the, the, the broader picture as well. But. Right. And um, Nathan, I want to get your thought on that in a second. But let me go to Liz first, which is, Liz, I want you to um, either embrace or destroy a theory I've had for a while. And this is just on the raw politics. So exciting. Of, yes, I know. It's, um, uh, 
look, we're going to take immigration for the moment, but this could be true of others, which is there is the debate about immigration, mm -hmm. and you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, but because it's basically an issue that helps Republicans, that if you're having, that, that really this is one of those issues where the turf matters. So that if a debate is, if an election debate is about immigration, that's on Republican turf, and that's bad for Democrats. Even if they win the individual debating points on immigration, every minute that's spent on immigration and not on abortion mm -hmm. is bad for Democrats. Is that right? I'm going to embrace that, yeah. Well, excellent. We have um, a moment of, of consistency no, here. No, you know, and I, I really, that's... And I'm, I'm a naturally nervous person, and I, that's when I really started to feel a little bit like a nervous Nelly about the sort of trajectory of the election changing, because Democrats had so much momentum, and you know Nathan walked through um, all the races that Democrats had won, and you know whether Kansas, Alaska, New York, and Minnesota, I think you said, um, and it felt like the wind was at our backs, and for the first time. Um, this cycle, it really felt like Democrats were able to turn the election from a referendum into a choice, and where we were saying, um, you know, not just like judge us on our job performance, like look at the Republicans and how extreme they are in abortion. And keep in mind that 10 years ago, when I worked for Barack Obama on his um, re-election campaign, when candidates like Todd Ake and Richard Murdoch came out and said, you know, a pregnancy from rape is a gift from God, or, you know, you can't get pregnant from rape, the National Party completely abandoned them, and they were just um, um, completely left behind, and we worked to try to tie their positions to every Republican in the party. Now, those positions are the mainstream. So, the, um, mainstream of the Republican Party, but they're so, 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 so far out of touch with voters. So, it was a, a perfect, perfect issue for Democrats to go on the offensive on. Then DeSantis did his, you know, Martha's Vineyard stunt, which was gross, cynical, inhumane, you know, you can use all those sorts of words. But as soon as it happened, it, I had this sort of deja vu. It reminded me of Donald Trump before Democrats learned how to deal with Donald Trump, which is that he would do things to stoke outrage among Democrats. And we would just light our, hairs on, light our hair on fire, run around, and all it ended up doing, all that it ended up doing was having us talk about Donald Trump on his terrain. And not, and it made us unable to get our own message out. And that's what I saw with the Ron DeSantis um, stunt, was that it sort of blocked out the sun for everything else. And it certainly talked, took us off of talking about our strongest issue, um, abortion, and instead talking about immigration, which is a, an issue where Republicans have a 20 plus point you know, um, advantage with voters over um, Democrats. And so yes, we, we can make, we can win the little debate points against Ron DeSantis, but if we are talking about immigration going into this election, we are losing. Right. So and that's one of the ways in which the dark arts of politics are distinct from that whole list of problems that I started with at the beginning. You can win talking about this set of issues and be given the power to handle this set of issues over here. And you can never have talked about this set of issues in a, in a, right. in a campaign. Yeah. Um, so Nathan, back to, to the Latino vote. Um, how, do, how does it play out in, in the House and Senate races this year? Uh, it, it depends, right? I mean, first, Latino voters are not monolithic. Sure. I mean, we're talking about South Florida, Cuban Americans, okay. South Texas, very different groups. How many generations has your family been here? The misconception is that Latino voters only care about immigration, right? But it's not true, right? I mean, Latino voters care about the economy, education, all crime, all the other things that uh, every other voter cares about. Um, what we're watching is some individual races. Uh, for example, uh, Congresswoman Salazar in uh, re the Republican Congresswoman in South Florida. Um, she is in a district that should be competitive. Um, there is a credible Democratic challenger, Annette Tadeo. But with the trend of Republicans doing better, Democrats are still winning Latino voters, but that gap is closing. Congresswoman Salazar looks like she is in good shape, although Democrats are feeling emboldened over the last couple of weeks. Um, South Texas, um, one of the best examples, or one of the best races I think to watch is new Congresswoman Myra Flores against Democratic Congressman Vincente Gonzalez. Uh, he, uh, you know, Flores, that special was important, uh, or it was interesting to me because I thought that maybe some of the gains among, with Republicans uh, among Latino voters was specific to Trump, that Trump had a unique appeal 
personality, right, specifically with male Latino voters, but that special election, I think, showed that it was something bigger. Trump wasn't on the ballot when Flores won the special, the second most Hispanic district in the country, uh, and she won. Now she's running in a different district that is more Democratic, but she is, it's competitive, and that is, that's a race that, uh, under normal circumstances, I would say that Democrats should win, but Republicans are on, on the offensive, and Republicans are on the offensive against Henry Bonilla, uh, as well, um, not Henry Bonilla, um, Henry Cuihar, going back to the Bush administration, I think, <laughs> with, that, with that Bonilla. Uh, so it's, and in some of these close races, uh, Latino voters are going to matter, though just like all of the voters, Nevada, Arizona, uh, Florida, are big, have big races uh, on the ballot. I know, we have so many states to go through. I think I'm gonna break it up by the House, Senate, and Governor's uh, races, because <laughs> um, we're gonna run out of time. But, um, so Jasmine, you, you've been to Michigan, Arizona, and covered those governor's races. You're headed back to Arizona. What have you, um, tell me what you saw in Michigan and Arizona from those governor's races uh, that we should know about. Yeah, um, so lots. <laughs> Arizona is a fascinating place. I mean, the, the number of independent voters has grown tremendously there. I think it's um, about a third now in the state and in Mar Maricopa County, where votes matter most, it is, um, it is, it is the number of independent voters or, or voters who don't affiliate with either party is, is actually larger now than Democrats or Republicans. So independent voters really, really matter there. And you're, so and it's a state where like you're really seeing a lot of these, these questions that we have come to roost, right? The, the far right MAGA movement that has taken over, the Trumpian wing of the party that has taken over the Republican party machinery, uh, you know the, the rise in these uh, candidates who, de who 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 clinched the nomination, denying the 2020 election, um, and now um, so and and now our, our, one of them is struggling to pivot while the other one is leaning further into the in the far right. And so that 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 would be Carrie Lake, who's running for governor mm -hmm. in Arizona, um, and she's she's running on the on that that Trump energy, betting that she doesn't really. Uh, she might not need that independent vote as much as people think she does. And Blake Masters, on the other hand, has kind of waffled a bit or is, is seen as, 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 as a flip-flopper, um, not, as, not as inauthentic. So you're, you're having you know, the questions about candidate quality, whether a candidate matters, you're seeing it there. You're gonna, that's going to be the test as well. Um, and so there's a lot of parallels to what's happening in Michigan, another state where the establishment wing and the Trumpian wing of the party have really been at odds, have been, were, fight, were in fighting all throughout the primary and it really hurt um, their candidate, um, their Tudor Dixon, who's running for governor against G Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Um, and, so, and so again, you're seeing parallels between Tudor Dixon, Blake Masters, and a couple of other candidates and other races that you know, came from the grassroots Trump being wing of the party and are now struggling to build a professional campaign, are struggling to raise funds, are getting pummeled by Democrats on, um, on television but could, could very well may still have a path to victory. And these governor's races matter, A, because in Arizona and Michigan, the governors helped get the vote count certified and locked in um, against strong efforts by those who believed the election was stolen, wrongly believed the election was stolen, to try to overthrow. So in 2024, it depends who, own, who is in the governor's office, and it's, it sets the conditions possibly for those two swing states for the, for the presidential. Right, and one more thing about Arizona, what we're talking about immigration, abortion. So voters there really tell me that they want to talk about the economy. Like that's the number one issue they want to talk about, but the candidates are really focused. They're, that's where you're really seeing these, these two narratives play out on the Democrat, the Democratic side. The, the conversation is centered on abortion, protecting women's rights. And on the Republican side, it's the border, it's immigration, it's Mark Kelly is not securing the border. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's just those ads. and. But it's not what voters want to talk about. <laughs> Liz. John, when, when we get to the end of this cycle, I wonder if Republicans are going to leave some winnable races on the table in the governor's races and Senate races because of candidate quality, that, that their candidates in those, some of the key races, I mean, Michigan should be a winnable race for Republicans. Remember, Glenn Youngkin, a year ago, won Virginia, the Biden won by 10 points. Now Republicans are having trouble keeping up in Michigan where Biden barely won in yeah. 2020, but this is where candidate quality matters. On the House side, 
not every Republican candidate is, is top tier, but they have, I would argue on par, better candidates on the Republican House side that can take advantage of an opportunity in this midterm. But even, I, Arizona is, is really, really, really fascinating to me, and I don't know, you know how much folks here have been following that race, but um, you have a U.S. Senate candidate, uh, Blake Masters, and then gubernatorial candidate, um, Carrie Lake, on the Republican side, and they largely have embraced the same positions, right? Most extreme sort of positions on, you know, every issue across the board. But um, Carrie Lake is doing a lot, a lot better than um, Blake Masters is. And why is that? Um, like, one... <sighs> And like I'm, I'm going to use a super technical political term to describe um, Blake Masters, but he's like a total weirdo, um, and he is someone who like in his free time dabbled in 9/11 trutherism. Is like he said weird stuff about you know oral contraception, um, and is someone who. Um, it's just like not great in front of a crowd, not great at interacting with voters. But Carrie Lake, and you know, I disagree with all of her politics, everything like that, but she does have this thing that Donald Trump had, which is this sort of feral magnetism to her. And when she goes out in campaigns, she doesn't apologize for anything. And she is, how she is different from a lot of these other candidates who are, you know, definitely on the weirdo spectrum um, of this cycle is that you see them avoiding the media. You see them hiding from debates. You see them hiding from the public. And she goes and she does media up the wazoo. She makes herself accessible to voters. She challenged her opponent, Katie Hobbs, to do debates, and Katie Hobbs turned the debates down. And so she's been running, um, even though she's in line with uh, like sort of the extreme positions, stylistically she's been running very, very different from a lot of these other candidates. And I think it's going to be a fascinating thing to watch because I think that might be a race where you do have, you know, sort of a split thing. And there is a little bit of a difference because Mark Kelly is a uniquely strong um, candidate, someone who very early on figured out ways to distance himself from Joe Biden on things like the border and came out early on with ads, um, you know, saying he would be tough on crime. He's the son of a police officer, opposes defund the police. Um, and Katie Hobbs is not quite as strong a candidate, but I do think that there is something to carry like style that other candidates, um, other Republican candidates probably could learn from. And you also have, uh, is it Mark Fincham, the Secretary of State, mm -hmm. Republican Secretary of State nominee, who is an election denier as well. Mm -hmm. So you have election deniers up and down the ballot in Arizona um, uh, in that race. Nathan, um, Republicans have to pick up a net one seat to take control of the Senate, a net six seats to take control of the House. Um, give me your overview of where you think those possibilities are at the moment. Yeah, um, Republicans, uh, I expect Republicans to win the House. Our range right now is plus eight to 20. Um, I think the net is five that they need, so that whole range is above, above what they need. But there's a big difference between them getting eight and having a three-seat majority or 20 and having a few more seats to spare in terms of the party's ability to govern or get anything done, uh, get any, anything done next year. I, I try to look at it, if Republicans don't win the House under these circumstances, an unpopular president, faltering economy, all these things, then there's going to be, you will want to buy popcorn and watch the movie that is the blame game and infighting on the Republican side about how, how they didn't take advantage of this opportunity. Uh, in the Senate, I think the Senate is almost as up for grabs as it can be. I, sitting here today, um, I hope this isn't recorded, right? This isn't live. Um, I think Democrats have a slight advantage to hold the Senate, to hold a 50-50 Senate. Um, our range right now is R plus one to D plus one, and you'll say, well, thanks for being on the stage and saying that either party, but that's, I think that's how close it is. And within that three seat range, Republicans, if they gain, they win, but the other two, a no net change or D plus one is a Democratic Senate. Uh, if you were to boil it down to three states, Georgia, Nevada, Pennsylvania, I think whoever wins two of those three is probably in control next year. And that's in the Senate races? Senate. Yeah. Jasmine, you mentioned that there's a disconnect between what you hear the politicians talking about and what the voters talk about. What else are you picking up from being on the ground talking to actual human voters um, in, in those states? And have you been to Georgia yet, or is it M Michigan and Arizona? I've mainly been to Michigan, Arizona. I did a little bit of Nevada, uh, and I spent a lot of time in Alaska. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Covering Sarah Palin and... Uh, 
Mary Poltola, who's the first oh, right, Alaska right. Native, in, Native in Congress. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so what else am I picking up from voters? I mean, well, I, I think it's, I mean, going back to, to Latino voters, a lot of the, when we're talking about independent voters in a lot of these states, it is Latino voters um, who, are, are, who, who are independent voters. Um, and I think from, from them, I'm hearing a lot of um, dissatisfaction with both parties. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a voting bloc that has been historically ignored by both by national campaigns for a long time on, on, on either side of the aisle, by campaigns on other side of the aisle for a really long time. Um, and so a, a lot of people are frustrated with Biden, especially in Nevada, they're frustrated with Biden over the economy, with, with, with the COVID um, restrictions, with the mass man, well, not the mass man so much, but the COVID restrictions that led to like business closures and they really felt the, the pain of that. But that's not necessarily driving them over to the Republican side. Um, so I am hearing a lot of that. Um, and yeah, and I, and I, and I would say, and I, I would say that across the board, I think we were talking at the, about this at the beginning, is I, I just don't know if we truly understand how much the pandemic has, impact, has had an impact on people yet, and, on, and not just on people, but on the campaigns themselves. Like mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of campaigns are not uh, holding debates, as many debates as they're used to. They're not allowing reporters in, in some events anymore um, because they can speak directly to the base. And then, and then also, I think spending all that time at, at home has driven a lot of people into these um, conspiracy, you know, these, these, these rabbit holes on, online that, that I'm just, I, I, I'm hearing more of the conspiratorial element in, in, in society um, that I wasn't when I was out in California in 2018 covering the midterms ahead of, you know, in, in, in the middle of the Trump years. Right. Liz, um, if you were advising candidates, as you mentioned earlier, um, the president's party takes a pounding. I think it's an average of 28 seats mm -hmm. lost since World War II. Um, and a president who's under 50 percent, I think they lose even more. So history would suggest Democrats are in for a pounding. As you mentioned with gas prices, every time somebody goes to the pump, they've been down, but there's, there's, if OPEC is cutting 2 million barrels a day, even if it's 1 million barrels a day, that might put pressure on prices. Uh, they're certainly seeing it everywhere else. What would you advise a Democratic candidate who's got voters who are basically seeing a negative ad every time they check out at the grocery store because prices are high or every time they fill up their car? How does a Democratic candidate get around that problem? Um, well, look, um, I think, Voters generally don't like when politicians like piss on their leg and tell them it's raining, you know? And like you like can't, if people feel something, you, sorry for that. Um, no, no, it's the reason it's, I asked the question. This is not live. It's okay. <laughs> it's not. No. Um, but you, like if someone feels something, you can't tell them that something they feel isn't real. It's like um, Democrats sometimes fall into this trap in crime when we're like, well, statistically, if you look at it, it's down over a two year average or this, that. No, if people feel unsafe, they feel unsafe. And we need to understand where they're coming from, acknowledge that they feel unsafe, and then say, okay, well, this is what we're gonna do to help you feel less unsafe. And with Democrats, what I advise Democrats to say, what I would advise other Democrats to say, is to acknowledge the pain that people feel. And, you know, it's not just, you can't just go and say, oh, well, gas prices have fallen for X number of months. And, you know, I know that, it, that the decrease um, sort of flatline recently, but um, you have to acknowledge the pain that they feel. Um, with gas prices, with inflation, and talk about the ways that Democrats are working to, you know, alleviate costs um, for for people. So, you know, whether it's allowing Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices, capping the price of insulin, um, you know, doing things like importing ba baby formula, whatever it is, um, there are, Democrats are actually trying to um, help alleviate costs. Republicans across the board are voting against all of these things. And why are they voting against these things? It's one, either because they don't care about you, they do not feel your pain, 
or two, because they know that if they vote against these things, if they vote against these things that make people's lives better, that help alleviate the pain, that that might give Democrats a little bit of a boost in, in going into the midterms. And no matter which one it is, it's bad. Um, and so I think what Democrats need to do is to speak to people, but make clear that um, there's a choice in this election, and at least Democrats are trying, whereas Republicans are obstructing relief at every turn. Um, Nathan, in Republican House races, so we've talked about the Republican candidates who are on the fringe of the, well, it's hard to know where the fringe is and whether the fringe is part of the rug, but <laughs> um, as Andy Card used to say, but um, those candidates who are embracing the furthest of Donald Trump. But in House, competitive House districts, where you have a more moderate electorate, are there, are there Republicans running in a different kind of way than um, sort of in the Glenn Youngkin mode that you mentioned earlier in Virginia? Um, are there structural incentives in the election that are, that are creating an atmosphere for a kind of more moderate Republican candidate because um, we're not really seeing it on the Senate side. Yeah, I mean, post-primary, we, we have seen some pictures of candidates with Trump disappear from websites after they win the primary, or we, we've seen some um, issue pages on abortion disappear from websites and competitive races. I think these Republicans know where they need to be, and they're trying to get there. The question is, you know, as Democrats shine the light that Liz was talking about, how much of that, how much of that matters. But where we see the Republican ads are on, Inflation, um, cost of living, crime, immigration. I mean, that pretty much covers. And, and you see it shift a little as, as some of the if gas prices, as they were coming down, you saw a little bit more of a shift toward crime uh, paired with immigration. If, if gas prices tick back up over the next few weeks, I think you'll see some shifting there. But that's largely the issue set. And that's why Republicans get frustrated. Uh, well, I mean, they're frustrated with the Dobbs decision or abortion. They don't really want to talk about that. And frustrated somewhat with President Trump or Mar-a-Lago and investigations because that muddies the picture. They want just voters to focus on, focus on the problems and look at who's in charge. Because right now, Democrats are in charge mm -hmm. and they're bearing the, they're uh, shouldering the responsibility for the problems and, and anything that's a distraction hurts Republican chances. Uh, Jasmine, wh how will you spend your time between now and Election Day? Um, and are there a set of questions you're trying to answer before? Um, so in 2020, some of the questions were, will suburban voters turn out for Donald Trump again? Um, will Joe Biden win enough working class white voters um, to improve on Hillary Clinton and therefore help his share with those voters, which, which will help him beat Donald Trump in the places he ended up beating him? Are there a set of questions like that that you're looking to investigate either when you're on the trail or that you're, that you're looking to see if election night will answer? Yeah, I mean, like I said, the, the independent voter, Latino voter questions are, are big ones. I'm really interested in this sense of um, this exhausted majority. There, there, were, there was at least one survey um, talking that, that polled Americans and found that most of them are, are in the center and they're exhausted from politics. And I'm wondering, do those people turn out? Do they just completely turn out or they tune out? Um, and they, they could play a key um, role in a lot of these races that we're talking about. And even like Ohio, where Tim Ryan is, has been aggressively pursuing exactly that type of person. Um, and then I'm also curious, I, I think one thing that, I'm, that we haven't actually been following much has, has been young voters, and I'm wondering whether that will be a surprise in the end, um, because the narrative has been that that enthusiasm is low. Um, but I'm wondering what, what happens now with you know, some of the, the, the debt proposal, the college debt proposal. And so those are kind of the things that I'm watching. And then, of course, again, that I, we, we focused a lot on, on the economy, and voters do want to talk about the economy. but. I don't want to downplay that 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 that, that cultural anxiety, that the xenophobia and the racism is still very much present. And beyond politics, what what does that do to uh, American society? Is 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 what's on my mind. Mm -hmm. um, Liz, either answer that question or this one. It's a choose your own adventure. Um, uh, which is how. If, let's imagine you worked for Barack Obama. Let's imagine he, at his best, was at the head of the Democratic Party. Would that help? I mean, he had an awful 2010. 
So, you know, the, the rhetorical skills of a president are way overrated. But I guess my question is, having listened to Democratic leaders talk about this election, it doesn't exactly, well, strike, <laughs> strike that. How's the Democratic Party doing on messaging? Um, so, but, you know, before this, I had an opportunity to sit with, um, I don't know, 15 students uh, across the street, and um, they talked about this. And I actually think the National Party, Joe Biden, that matters less to me as someone who's worked on a lot of gubernatorial yeah. ca campaigns, who's worked on a lot of Senate campaigns, who's worked on a lot of House races, I mean, DA races, whatever, I've worked on 20 campaigns, like dog catcher. So, um, is that it's, it's not up to Joe Biden, it's really up to every campaign and every candidate to do this. And so, you have the option to take a referendum election and turn it into a choice election. And we've seen some candidates be able to do that successfully. And I don't know if it's going to be enough to put them over the edge. But a great example, I would say, would be Tim Ryan in Ohio. Yeah. He has just been beaten J.D. Vance with a two by four for months, saying that, you know, this is a guy, we're both sons of Ohio, but I never turned my back. This guy went to Yale, he moved to San Francisco, he's heading like all that like elite checklist stuff. Um, then he comes back, he starts this sham nonprofit to com combat the opioid crisis, and then he hires like a pharma mouthpiece to, to work there. And also while he's doing that, he's defining himself as, you know, a voice for like the working class in Ohio um, and doing something that Barack Obama did smartly because sometimes when we think of how Barack Obama won, it, you think of the Obama coalition when really it was, yeah, sure, he had the Obama coalition, uh, black, brown, younger voters, but he also won states like Ohio because he was able to cut into um, Republicans' margins in more rural areas. And so if you, it's up to candidates. Right. It's, we, no, no one at the top is going to save us. So it's like, that's why people like Mark Kelly, Warnock, um, Tim Ryan, I think they're running really smart campaigns and being able to do that. And Fetterman's doing that to Oz. And, and Ma Mastriano, uh, no, sorry, not Mastriano, Shapiro in Pennsylvania right. has done a great job. Right. Although I do think it's possible, let's say someone like, uh, I don't know, Pete Buttigieg, uh, <laughs> goes out and talks on Fox News, and his ability to frame switch a conversation to make it a choice and not a referendum is something then candidates go and copy. That, that was my only yeah, no, point I, about a national. It's okay, you don't, I, I, you're, you're a fan of it. <laughs> um, and we're running out of time. So, um, all right, Nathan, last question to you before we open it up for, for Q&A. Um, I'm going to ask you a version of the question, uh, question, which is what questions do you hope to see answered or are you looking to have answered in the next five weeks or less than five weeks and or on election night and it, you can be as granular as you want. You can say, you know, is the Abigail Spanberger race, that's what I'm looking at because that'll tell me early in Virginia how the rest of the country's going to go or whatever you, yeah. what question are you looking to have answered? Um, well, a big question is, is this going to be the last election that we have polling ever again? <laughs> I mean, we'll, we'll, we're going to have a good, we're going to have a good idea of whether polling is sort of permanently broken or not. My actually working hypothesis is that and maybe it's a naive trust, I think it's actually going to be pretty good in leading us in the direction, in part because Trump's not on the ballot, which I think skews things a little. Um, two, I think there are some bellwethers on the East Coast that hopefully we get early results, like Spamberger. Uh, she has a, I think she has the edge right now. Um, mm -hmm. If she ends up losing, then I think that's probably a bigger night for Republicans. Or you can move uh, just up the road a little bit to Maryland's 6th District with Congressman David Trone, uh, who extremely wealthy. Um, it's, a, it's a district that Democrats sh should win, but it has a lot of rural area going out to Western Maryland. And so if Republicans are winning that type of race that they're not supposed to win right now, I think that would be a, a big night. Um, I'll give you one projection that I hope I'm very wrong on about this election is that I think post-election, we are in for um, a little bit of chaos. I mean, I think, we have, taken for, I think we have taken for granted the voting casting of ballots and the certification of these elections. And I think we're gonna see, um, uh, let me give you one example and, I'll, and I won't monopolize this. Um, in, the, in the primary in New Mexico, in Otero County, there was an election commissioner who said, I don't, I don't agree with these results. They just don't look right to me. I'm not going to certify it. And there was no quantitative basis for that, but the court stepped in and said, no, you need to certify the election. It was certified. Everyone went on their merry way. I can foresee that playing out over a couple dozen places where you have 
local officials uh, who would just say, no, this doesn't, this doesn't feel right to me, or this happened, or this happened. And then the, if we have delays in certification and the, and the... Well, you have candidates who haven't even committed to accepting the results. Right, exactly, yeah. In House and Senate, depending on how close yep. it is, do we know who's in control of the House or the Senate, depending on these delayed certifications? So I, I hope yeah. I am very, very wrong. I'm concerned that that's where we're headed yeah. post-election. I mean, the Post has a piece up right now that the majority of Republican candidates are election deniers from the last election. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine some portion of those candidates, if they lose, will will raise that again. Um, and then keep in mind also the DLCC, they do the state ledger races, they did, um, they tracked, and there are hundreds of people running for state offices across the country who were actually there at January 6th. Yeah. So you have, um, you know, people who were actively a part of that, you know, violent attack on the on the Capitol. Oh, federal, can there are House candidates, multiple House oh, candidates Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Doug the Mastriano state. was there. Right. All right, let's open this now to um, questions. Where is, is the microphone getting, coming to you? Um, I think it is. Kate, okay, I think right there in the blue. Yes, you. Oh, I think you wanna to go to the mic so we can all. Yeah, so I was wondering, do you think that DeSantis has what it takes to like win the Republican nation or is he like too small, too like effeminate talking, too like toxic, like do you think that when Republican voters see more of him, they'll be like, oh, never mind. Let me add, so the question is, Ron DeSantis, a possible presidential nominee. One thing, let me add for whoever wants to grab this, uh, DeSantis has an interesting, so Dub, George W. Bush and um, Chris Christie ran for president when they were up for reelection, but they had cakewalks. Um, do you, uh, so that's a little bit different for DeSantis, although he's doing, he's like seven points ahead of Chris at the moment, so his race may not be that big a deal, but who wants to take on the DeSantis? I'll, I'll start, because I'll, I'll do, do this quick. Um, is, because uh, I, I followed Christie very closely, I'd worked um, for John Corzine in that race when Christie first won, and um, I think DeSantis is facing a very, very tough decision, right? Um, Christie decided not to run in, in 2012, um, and then ran in 2016, and by 2016, like, if you want someone who's offensive, gross, whatever, like, you're not gonna beat Donald Trump. So his stick just wasn't gonna work then, and I think the consensus is that his window was 2012, and that's when he should have run. And I, with DeSantis, there is a fear in his world that if he doesn't take this opportunity, that, um, that it's gone, that, you know, at some point being governor takes a toll on you. Um, as for how well he wears, I mean, if you read the profiles of him, if you talk to people in Florida, if you talk to people in Congress, he's not a particularly likable guy. He's not a particularly gregarious guy. He doesn't do the glad handing. And I mean, you know what it takes to run for, for president. When you're in Iowa, when you're in New Hampshire, you're talking to a crowd of 15 people and you need to think, act like everything they're saying is the most funny, exciting thing you've ever heard, then you gotta go and sit down with a podcaster who only has 10 listeners. And I just don't think that Ron DeSantis has that in his DNA. And to anybody who might say, well, neither did Donald Trump, Donald Trump was a star. Yeah, he was a star, but he did, he, he is a good glad hander though. That, that's and, and he did do a lot of, and, and over time, if you look at the beginning of the, um, of the uh, 2016 race, and for most of it, he did a lot of media, and a lot of one-on-one -on -one media, but did, he yeah. certainly scaled back as president. Right, uh, okay, oh good, we have a, a line here. All right, fire away. Awesome. Hi, um, my name is Malia Allen, I'm a fourth year in the college. Um, so, following January 6th, I feel like we've seen a lot more focus on like the election conspiracies, like fraud, um, and other things like that. Um, I'm wondering, I feel like this has placed more emphasis on people watching things like the Secretary of State races, Attorney General races, and other like executive races that aren't like um, nationwide offices. Um, I was wondering, like, do you think that emphasis is relevant? How much power do these offices have? How much should we really be like looking into this for all of you guys? They hold tremendous power, those are local elections offices. I mean, they run the whole system. Yeah, and I've, I've spent a lot of time, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to voters about, voters and elections officials um, who are really concerned and are dealing with the threats every day. And it's, it's uh, yeah, I've had at least one or two elections officials now just 
want to like talk about how they just want to shake people who have been calling their office with with conspiracy theories. Um, so yeah, no, I think you should definitely be paying attention. I don't know if any, you have anything more to add. I agree. <laughs> but I think that there's a problem. Like Republicans have focused so much on the local level um, in a way that Democrats haven't. Um, they had a 50-year plan to overturn Roe, and you know they accomplished it. Um, over the last 12 years, Republicans have outspent Democrats three to one um, in terms of state legislative races, and as a result, we've lost a thousand, um, you know, state state house, state senate seats across the country. Country. And I think Republicans have taken over 20, flipped 28 legislative chambers. And this is this is like my hobby horse, this election. But what's crazy to me is last cycle, the the total amount of um, dollars that went into uh, Democratic state house races was 50 million dollars. Over 90 million dollars went into Amy McGrath's race in, in Kentucky. She lost by over 20 points. And uh, it's really, really important to me and for the Democratic Party that we stop acting like congressional and Senate races and the presidency are the only races that matter. Because where the crazy stuff, where the breeding grounds for extremism are, it's in these state capitals. And just one other quick thing on sec secretaries of state. The voting procedures are, are kind of arcane mm -hmm. and they require a lot of specialized knowledge. And it was Brad Raffensperger's understanding of that specialized knowledge that allowed him to keep swatting back the fantasies and conspiracies and madness that he was being pelted with because he knew how to run what he was doing. A lot of the people who are running now, and that was true for in Michigan and Arizona and these other states, the, a lot of the people who are running now uh, aren't, didn't get into it because they were really into making sure there was a <laughs> perfectly accurate set of um, you know, procedures in place to get the vote. They're in it for more ideological, political reasons. And once you do that, it puts a lot of energy in the system, which can be used in you know, all kinds of uh, ways that aren't um, healthy. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jack Altman, a fourth year in the college here. Um, I was wondering, in previous midterm cycles, like 2018, 2010, even going back to 1994, for example, we kind of saw the out-of-power party running on what they intended to do in a divided Washington. Do any of you get any sense of what we could expect in a dividing Washington, as seems likely, other than nothing getting done legislatively? Uh, if there, I, I expect some impeachment trials. Yeah, I mean, Republicans, they'll control the legislative agenda, particularly when talk about the House side, but they've been explicit about, I think, that they will be in charge of investigations. I think they're going to investigate Hunter Biden, Merrick Garland, Secretary Mayorkas. There are members who have said they're, they're going to investigate, uh, or they have articles of impeachment already drafted against Biden. I'm not saying that Republicans should or will, but re the Republican leadership is going to have to deal with the part of the caucus that does want to move forward in that way. Fundamentally, we're going to have a divided Washington because we're going to have a Democratic president. And the two parties are going to have to figure out, okay, are we going to work together to maybe solve some problems? Or is this just the, the, the appetizer for 2024? And neither party, I think Liz said at the beginning, neither party wants to give the other side an upper hand in the next election. Uh, and that's what potentially working together at the legislative level in 2023 or, or early 2024 would do. So I... I start as skeptical that we're going to see a lot because it'll be divided. It'll be divided, and also if Kevin McCarthy has a three, four vote margin, he's going to be, it's going to be hard for him to make any kind of deals without worrying about defections from his own side right. in a way that's more complicated than the job Pelosi has. All right. Thanks. Hi, my name is Divya Marothra. I'm a second year in the college studying political science and business economics. Um, so I had a two-part question for you all. Um, the first was, I know you've been talking about like state legislative races. Are there any other types of races that aren't congressional and aren't state legislative that you're paying attention to in this cycle? Uh, looking at like DA races or state judiciary races, especially in context of Dobbs. And then the second part is um, the Supreme Court is taking up a case about the independent state legislature. Mm -hmm. um, theory, Very important. Yeah, so what are your thoughts on that and how could that affect, you know, post-2022 and then 2024 and going forward? 
Well, I'll take the second part and then I'll let yeah, you guys talk about the other. But the um, that is like, and thank you for raising that. And that is one of those things that more people should be talking about, um, because essentially the Supreme Court is going to bring up, take up a case, and you're you're smarter than I am and know this stuff, but you might be able to explain it better. But it, that it essentially would allow state legislatures to throw out the results of an election if they disagree with them, and that is terrifying. That is terrifying, and we know that this is an extremist um, concern conservative court, um, and we certainly saw that with Dobbs, and we know the direction they're going in. So it is not outside the realm of possibility that they could take this up. And that is why I keep returning to this state legislature, state legislature, state legislatures. I'm working with a state senator in Michigan, Mallory McMorrow, um, who is working to flip the Michigan State Senate, probably the most likely state level chamber to flip. But um, this is her big issue, is trying to educate people on this. Because you know, in the media, and I'm not attacking the media, but th there is less focus on these races because you know, it's more parochial, it's not as sexy, it's harder to do a national angle on it. But if, they are, if the Supreme Court does this, like, woo, who boy. And so that is something I would encourage all of you to go home and read about and think if there are state legislators, that if you are, I don't know if you all live here or in other states or if you have family members in other states, talk to them and say, this is why it's really, really, really important to make sure that you cast a vote against an election denier because that person then could be responsible for making sure your vote doesn't count if they disagree with it. And even oh, if the... Oh. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, I was just going to say, so I'm not really tracking, um, uh, I'm, re I'm really just focused on congressional races, and, um, but, but it, I think it, it will be something that we'll be looking at, or I'll be looking at moving forward. I mean, especially, you, you brought up Michigan. There's concern among Republicans that Tudor Dixon, uh, the Republican nominee, isn't, doesn't have the momentum and, is, and, and could even hurt, uh, because she doesn't have that momentum, that it could hurt uh, Republicans down ballot and lose control of the... Senate, and on the other, on the flip side, does Gretchen Whit Whitmer, uh, you know, d does uh, boost for her help Democrats I I at the state house level? So, so looking at like the downstream of of the impact of the congressional races will be something that we'll be looking at. And then just one more thing on the state capitals. I mean, be be because we should be more focused. I mean, I. I've, I tell, I've told this story before, but one of the first assignments when I started covering politics was 2016, right before uh, Donald Trump. Before that, I did state, you know, uh, courts, criminal crime courts, all, all, all kinds of stuff. But when I really started to focus on politics, one of the first stories I covered was at the Sacramento, uh, was for the LA Times, um, covering state politics for the LA Times, was uh, this. Um, this, uh, these protests between neo-Nazis and anti-white supremacist, anti-white supremacist groups outside of the Sacramento State Capitol um, got into got, seven people ended up stabbed, and so like from there, from 2016, you could already see this rise in violence that we were going to be, we were going to see four years mm -hmm. later in all kinds mm -hmm. of capitals in the capital in Michigan, and that we were going to see on yeah. January 6th. So it is something to to pay attention to. <laughs> okay, next. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vikram. I'm a first year at the college. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, you mentioned that Georgia was going to be one of the most competitive Senate races this year. I wanted to ask about all the scandals that have surrounded Herschel Walker uh, and the poll that came out yesterday showing Warnock with the 12 point lead. Uh, how solid do you think those numbers are, and would you still consider Georgia a toss up? <laughs> Can um, I just, was can there I some, just did something come out about Walker? Yeah. It wasn't really can good. I just <laughs> say how proud I am that we're just now getting to Walker? <laughs> oh my God, thank God. Um, so. Yes, Georgia is one of the top Senate races in the country. No, I do not believe that it is a 12-point race. I mean, there, <laughs> Georgia has a, both candidates have a high floor, low ceiling. I mean, it's operating in a very narrow margin right now. Um, and it's too early to know whether that specific event is really impacting voters or polling. You need to basically wait for an event to happen, let it soak in for at least a few days, then, you know, poll, survey, and really get a pulse of things. So anything that comes out, even the next day or so, I'm, I'm skeptical that it's really demonstrating the impact. I, I've lost, completely lost the ability to realize what disqualifies someone from public office anymore. Uh, and this was even before this event. Uh, but what I will say about Georgia is that it doesn't have to be a big event to make a difference because the Georgia race is so close. Neither of Warnock nor Walker have a lot of any room for error. Uh, the, so 
it, it, it doesn't have to be big to make a difference. What I'm also paying attention to is it looks like we're headed for a runoff. Um, and this time the runoff is in December. It's not January this time, but December 6th. Uh, and it could, the fight for the Senate could be once again, or the control of the Senate could be on the line in Georgia. Uh, but I'm, I, I'm just in a wait and see. I'm, I'm, I'm old now, and I just like, when an event happens, I try to take a deep breath. It's like, let's wait, and let's see how real people react to this rather than just you know, my reaction or Twitter reaction. Hi, my name is Nadia Osman, and I'm a fourth year in the college. So this question is for Jasmine. There's a pretty large um, electorate that is up for grabs for the Democrats, and they're largely Biden 2020 voters, but they're not really for anybody extreme on the Republican side. They're kind of unmotivated. Have you spoken to any of these voters, and have you understood kind of what they're thinking, where their head is at in this election? Yeah, I mean, these are the voters that I've been talking to. The, the, it, a lot of them are, are independent. A lot of them are... Wait and see. I don't think anybody really knows what is going to happen yet. Um, but again, it, it goes to all these issues that we've been talking to. Like they want to hear more about the economy, but then you have, you know, Blake Masters and Mark Kelly focusing on, on the border. You know, the back and forth on the border. So that that's exactly like when I, I when I meant the exhausted majority. Like that's the question that I have. Hey, thank you for your time. I'm Rohit. I'm a grad student at Harris. Uh, my question is that we've been talking about the rules of the game a lot. The Secretary of State elections, uh, election denying. I remember when January 6th happened and literally the papers certifying the elections were at risk. As you've mentioned, the election process is very archaic, although it's accurate. A lot of it is based on volunteers at the local level. And as you said, it's very complicated. Um, this is maybe a little unfair of a question, but how do we reform it in a way that is sustainable? And, you know, you spoke about political violence and you spoke about that, that increasing. Can we even get to a point where we can make rules in a sustainable fashion that both sides would accept? Is that even possible? Thank you. I, gosh, thinking out loud in front of an audience is a great thing to do. Um, <laughs> I am not convinced that the system is broken. Um, I mean, I, I don't think it's perfect, but I think the problem is now that it's, been, it's become even more political. It used to be one of the only things that was sort of apolitical. There's politics and everything, but how we actually voted and access to voting and counting and certification, those were not partisan issues, and, and, now, it, and now it is. And uh, so, the, I mean, the reforms, if they're going to happen, I guess I leave it up to people to decide whether, but it's going to have to happen at an individual local level, at the state level, because that's how our process works. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I've, I've seen just from reforms in general, if it's complicated or people don't understand it, their first instinct is to vote no until maybe they fully understand. So some of it, it might take a couple of times, like uh, redistricting in California, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger proposed redistricting reform with some retired Supreme Court, state Supreme Court justices. It got crushed. <laughs> it wasn't even close. And it took a couple of cycles, and finally then there was the Citizens Redistricting Commission. But it, because of, it's a complicated process, it took a while to, to really get passed. The people who study um, election systems actually think that this last election wasn't, was a triumph, actually, because it was in the middle of a pandemic, there was massive turnout, and actually the amount of actual fraud was very low, and that the systems were able to be double and triple and quadruply checked because of all of the kind of belt and suspenders that had been put in place. So I think, um, I, I think what you were maybe saying, or what I heard you say at first was, there's the question of how to fix the system, but then there's the question of how do you fix a system when I read that clock and it says 637, and Nathan reads it and says it reads 737. That's not about fixing the clock. Right, yeah. that's, a, that's a question of whether everybody engaged in the debate is uh, operating in, in good faith. And at the moment, you have a significant number of people who are lying about the last election. And so it's hard to have a reform um, in that in that context. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Jacob. I'm a first year at the college, uh, and we've you guys have talked a lot about kind of the conditions of the election, like 
things that have happened, gas prices, this and that. Though I, Biden has made some substantive policy decisions, especially a couple recently, like um, student debt, which, and just today, he, he dropped some news that he was pardoning all uh, people convicted of federal marijuana uh, possession and maybe changing the schedule. And those are pretty clearly, like, trying, you know, good things, but also trying to appeal to, like, the common person. Um, how effective do you think that those will be in trying to, you know, put a finger down in, a, in what is definitely a very chaotic, turbulent uh, con set of conditions? I mean, that's the, that's the messaging problem that we're talking about. And I've been talking to voters, and a lot of them don't know that he's passed these things mm -hmm. or aren't paying attention. Or Again, it goes back to, like, the question about the independent voter, the exhausted majority. It's like, uh, it, it, for a long time and, it, it, you know, through this cycle, I've, I've been on the ground at different points, and, like, people aren't paying attention. It's just not breaking through. And so I think now that's changing a little bit. That's, that, that's changing a little bit, but I don't know if it's enough. And I don't know if... Uh, Anybody else wants to add more? To yeah, Liz, why aren't Democrats more grateful for their president? <laughs> well, I, and you know, the, the, there is an issue, right? With the Inflation Reduction Act, is you know some of the best provisions in there, allowing Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices, capping the price of insulin for um, people on Medicare. That's not going to go into effect immediately. So um, people aren't going to reap the benefits of it before November. So that's part of the reason why they don't know about it. So I mean, it's good. I think that what Democrats can tell talk about is what I said before is it shows priorities. Democrats are trying to lower your costs. Republicans aren't aren't lifting a finger to do that. Um, the announcement today obviously was huge, historic, and that's something that people are going to feel immediately um, and, you know, can change a lot of people's lives. So. Um, I, I can't say that I've like seen any data research on it. I know generally it's a popular position. I don't know how much it motivates people, but it is a massive number of people whose lives it will affect immediately. So we could see, um, we could really see, and and disproportionately, it's um, you know uh, black and brown voters, um, and so. Um, it could it could be a help to Democrats. I just don't know. This just happened this afternoon. And if we can so. add quickly, one of the major things at the beginning of the administration, the COVID Relief Act, it happened at a time though where we were facing inflation. So something that was you know passed and meant to help the American people, a lot of people just said, oh, that's more spending, and we have an inflation problem, and that, then that just kind of it turned what should have been an asset for Democrats into a liability, even though the the motive was right. Um, I'm being told we can only take two more questions, so thank you for that, and um, sorry to those who were patiently in line. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tyler Shasti. I'm a first year in the college, prospectively majoring in law letters in society and economics. And my question's for Liz, as a Democratic strategist, I'd like to get your take on this. So in states like Pennsylvania and Illinois, we've seen the Democratic Governors Association put a lot of money behind Republican candidates that are election deniers, such as Doug Mastriano and, and, and Darren Bailey in Illinois. And so. Do you think that doing that can end up biting the Democrats in the butt in November? We've, we've talked about how important governors are in certifying elections and making sure things go smoothly. The other day, Jen Psaki defended this, saying Democrats have to do whatever they can to win these elections. So I'd like to get your take as a Democratic strategist on uh, bolstering these, these people's chances and their name recognition. Right. Um... Well, it brings to mind and one of my favorite phrases in politics is politics ain't beanbag. You know, and you got to play to win. And I understand it's not pretty. I understand it muddles the message a little bit. And sometimes some of these maneuvers make me feel a little bit queasy. Um, but my old boss did this with Todd Aiken. Um, my old boss, Claire McCaskill, did this with Todd Aiken in 2012 and kept her, her seat. And um, if you look at the candidates that this money was put behind, it's Doug Mastriano, the guy in Illinois, um, Tudor Dixon. They didn't do it with Carrie Lake. Um, they, uh, I think they did it with a person in Wisconsin. These are people who are now on track to lose, whereas um, if they had put, um, put it behind, if you had allowed, and like, let's also look at the alternative, okay? In Pennsylvania, you had Doug Mastrano, but the number two candidate was Lou Barletta, who was like literally a fake elector for Donald Trump. So like your choice there, and you, you didn't have some like uh, guy who was like some beacon for democracy and fair voting, right? But I really do think sometimes you got to play to win. Sometimes it isn't pretty, but I would rather win, play with fire, but then win, and I think we will on those races. Thank you. I'm Davis. I'm a first year in the college. 
Uh, and my question pertains to social media in the sense that there are a lot of big names that seem to be outperforming their opponent on social media. Fetterman Oz comes to mind, or Charles Booker. Uh, should voters who, who see a candidate as the preferred candidate who is outperforming their opponent, should they be worried about them because they're going to focus too much on what's getting them likes on social media as opposed to what other voters who aren't on social media want? Uh, or does social media engagement and uh, the performance on social media actually matter or have any predictive power in determining the outcome of an election? At, I time, don't, at I times don't. it looks like Fetter, uh, uh, Oz's social media is working for the Fetterman campaign, but that's a <laughs> slightly different question. Yeah. I mean, I, in terms of someone who's trying to project elections, I do not pay attention to how many Twitter followers or some. I mean, ultimately it's up to a campaign to turn that social media following into fundraising dollars and turn it into votes. So I, I'll, I'll pass on the first part and say, okay, is it turning into fundraising dollars and votes? Because that's really what matters. And there are some states that under normal conditions, a state like Kentucky, we talked about McGrath, you brought up Booker, that unless there's extraordinary circumstances, it doesn't matter if Booker's got 8 million, I don't even know how many Twitter followers he has, it's not going to, there are not enough votes there uh, for him, for him to win. Work in Texas? Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, there's so many. <laughs> yeah, and but if you look at Joe Biden, um, he was like no one's preferred candidate on Twitter, but in real life, he won. You look at Eric Adams in the New York mayoral race. I live in New York City. I didn't see any Eric Adams stands on Twitter. He won the election and he won across demographic groups. So um, I think sometimes too much importance is put on social media. But it, it can be a force for good and, and you can turn it into some things. Like for instance, um, we were asked about the independent state legislature thing before. Um, Mallory McMorrow did a big thread on it. Um, and generally you don't really associate Twitter with raising money. And um, it wasn't like some cynical ploy just to raise money. She was just trying to raise awareness about it. And off that one thread, she raised $50,000, which is nothing to sneeze at, especially when you're a state senator. Okay. All right. We're going to. Uh oh. Oh, oh, there it is. Oh, Greta my Ringer God. Is this allowed? Is this allowed? <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend. I'm David Axelrod, I'm class of 76. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. we've been meaning to, what, to uh, talk to you about your I, grades. Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to graduate this year. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I don't have a question. I just want to thank you so much. The Institute of Politics is what it is because smart, seasoned, thoughtful practitioners like yourselves are willing to give uh, their time and share their thoughts and hear the very good questions of uh, our audience and so I just wanted on behalf of everyone here to thank you for for being with us being with us now and uh, uh, and sharing your 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 wisdom with us thank you thank you all Appreciate it. well and thank you David for giving us a place to come and uh, and and holding up these kinds of conversations so and yeah. to everybody here at the IOP all these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.